Hi everyone, hope you're doing well, it's Ren here. Saturday has been a beautiful day. Uh, oh, and welcome to my room by the way. Saturday has been a beautiful day uh, and you know, I feel blessed for that. Um, which means that uh, yeah, I've been in a good mood for, uh, for the most part. So in this video I wanted to resume the... Wait a second. Yeah. Um, in this video, I wanted to resume the questions and answers thing that I had started in my INFJ answers your questions of two days ago because I had not been able to answer all the questions essentially because my answers tended to be a little uh, loquacious, <laughs> but I, I, I enjoy giving attention to uh, every person that uh, asks me a question and I will always do that. So uh, that might mean that at times uh, I get a little bit carried away. Uh, so I have two more people that I wanted to answer questions from. Uh, Jay the Music Maker and Running Fox. So um, since I'm always starting based on you know, who posted uh, er, like earlier, I'll start with Jay and I think Jay has a... Uh, ask quite a few questions which is why I I thought it might be good to to start a whole new video to address these questions so I'm just gonna read what Jay has to say so Ren I feel like you would do a great you would do great during a live show thanks appreciate it just think of it as a chill session with your viewers and you will have a great time perhaps it can be a live video concept with a QA and a at the end or something along those lines yeah that's a good idea I'll, I'll definitely keep that in mind I'll bookmark it um, also, I have been waiting for one of these Q&As. I'll post my questions in the sub-comments. So, the questions that I'm going to list very shortly. Uh, I, wanted just, I just wanted to let you know that I'll be rooting, voting for you in the Talk with Famous People, New Typology, March Madness, teams ran, Team Ren's Room for the Win. Yeah, you mentioned that. Uh, well, I mean, I had read your comment before. Well, I need to look more into what this is, this March Madness thing. Uh, I think uh, D Brown uh, has also mentioned that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm kind of curious. I'm kind of curious. I need to. I need to look more into it. You know what? It might not seem like obvious. I'm not sure because basically I'm posting almost every day or pretty much every day these days. So it might look like I have like lots of time on my hands, but my days are very regimented and like I'm doing things all the time. Uh, and usually the span of time within which I'm just just indulging in like leisurely activities where I just browse YouTube and do these things. There's not, it's not, there's not a lot of time in the day when I have time for that because I, I do a lot of things, you know, between the philosophy, the reading, the making videos. Uh, but I definitely want to take some time. Uh, in the meantime, just want to thank you for being supportive. I really, really appreciate it. It means that you acknowledge uh, or rather that you appreciate my content and uh, I hope that you will continue to appreciate my content. Uh, Every single comment that I've read by you has been insightful, has been um, flattering, has been all these things. So thank you again. Now, on to the real thing, which is your questions. So what are, what are Jay's questions? So here are a few of my questions. Uh, you don't have to answer them all if you don't want to. I'll understand. So uh, here, you have asked a lot of questions. I will try to answer all of them. If I just find that I cannot answer them in depth, I will not answer them in depth. I might do it for in another video or, you know, I'll address it briefly. Let's just have a look at the questions. So the first question is, uh, what are your thoughts on imposter syndrome? It's an interesting question because I feel like, uh, I feel like, you know, imposter syndrome is definitely something very real uh, and it's something that I've definitely felt myself. So I am no stranger to the syndrome of imposter syndrome. Now, I'm not sure that I will be able to extrapolate from, from this experience of the imposter syndrome to, if you like, to the, um, to the, to the condition of the INFJ because I have not given that enough thought, but it, maybe that could constitute good content, a good uh, sort of research area for me or thought area for me to potentially make a video on. 
in the future once my like thoughts have kind of consolidated around the topic of INFJ and imposter syndrome because it's definitely something that I've read often you know that INFJs have imposter syndrome a lot like more than maybe the average person or other types or at least are among the types that are likely to have it um, of course it's tempting it's tempting to think that this is again relating related primarily to NIFE because NI provides like a strong sort of perceptual insight and FE makes it kind of, of of universal application which means also of direct social application to the context at hand which means that we are extremely sensitive to any potential wave of social perception that are emitted around us so if we are constantly feeling as if we are being looked at in a way and very sensitive to it the idea that we could be seen as imposters for a certain thing is more likely to happen than for other people because we'll just be very attentive to it um, now in my case the funny thing is um, I need to not in order not to feel imposter syndrome I need to kind of feel like I have researched something a lot and I'm very expert at it, or at least I, I, I'm, I'm very good and I'm very knowledgeable to the extent that it's clear that I'm way more knowledgeable than the average person. And from that moment, I feel kind of the security that allows me to go beyond the sense of having this, the imposter syndrome. But the interesting thing is that it's, there seems to be some kind of dialectical relationship, which means that with me, and that's not necessarily something that I'm proud of, but there is, there is this constant, I don't know if it's a tug of war, or if it's a to and fro between imposter syndrome and like being almost too sure of myself, which is like two extremes. It's like I'm here or rather I'm here. So I'm likely to have a bit of an imposter syndrome usually. And I find it hard to believe that I, what I do is always like really great. Maybe not, you know, that's not, maybe not a healthy thing, but like um, I have a hard time believing the, the things that people tell me. And I always wonder, am I not an imposter? But the moment that I managed to bring myself to believe it, I then face another danger, which is that of overconfidence and hubris. Uh, and so finding out the balance is, is, is tough. Okay, so next question. Um, how was your life growing up alongside your INFP and ENFP brothers? Were you guys close or distant? Did you guys get along or were you guys always bickering? Um, so... So just to specify, uh, Cedric, the ENFP brother, he's more, he's a step brother, um, which doesn't mean that I don't love him. I certainly do love him and we consider each other to be brothers, but I've known him, I've known him uh, only from age 15 or 16 onwards, you see. Okay, at a push could be 14, but I think it's 15. Um, and at that age, well, because, you know, he is, Cedric is the son of my dad's second wife. Um, my mom was my dad's first wife, and Cedric is, my, is the son of my dad's second wife. My dad is divorced uh, from my second wife. And my, both my parents are single. My mom never remarried. Um, and it's funny because, just as a little aside, in the video that I made with my parents, a lot of people thought they were together, which to me, it was a very heartwarming thought because it suggested that um, you know, there was a great vibe in the room and that my parents got on, you know, and, 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 and there, there've been, it's been a bumpy time here and there. They've been divorced for 20 years now. So it's crazy to think that they've been divorced for 20 years, but they're definitely going through a period at this point with time having passed and looking back where they, they get on well naturally. And uh, that's cool. Uh, but in any case, so Cedric, I've known, I, I, I got to know him when I was at an age where like the bickering and the fighting and these things, it was not no longer really something that I was doing. So I never really fought with Cedric. Whereas with my brother, the INFP brother, when we were young, we, we would bicker a lot. We would compete for, potentially compete for our mother's attention. Uh, and we would, you know, just, I have to say, I was not always a great brother. I, I think that I went through a phase of just, um, I think I went through a phase of just being jealous, jealous of my brother a little bit of the, you know, because he was the second one. So he was getting a lot of stuff before I like prior to like at the age, prior to the age, I had to wait until before I could get those stuff. I, the most significant example was, uh, and it sounds very, it sounds very petty and it sounds very insignificant, but to me at the time it was very significant. I, 
I, I around age 14 or something, I wanted to skateboard, my, my mother and my dad. <sighs> At the time it must have been my mother because my, my parents were divorced by then, but she was against it. She said, no, 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 I don't want you to skate, blah, 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 blah. And she gave me all of these reasons. And then uh, a, a year later, when my brother was 12, he was allowed to have his skateboard the same at the same time that I was allowed to have one and that I was pissed off about that and you know I, I just I mean I experienced I went through a phase of experiencing some jealousy and I think that I came out of that um, only maybe in my kind of later teens you know uh, and now like it's it's no longer the case obviously I was I was the worst when I was very young I can't remember that when my brother was a baby and was legitimately um, just requiring all my parents' attention. And I was, I, apparently, my dad tells me up to this day that I was, I was not happy with that. <laughs> it's, probably not the, it's probably not too uncommon for, for brothers. Um, and when you're the el, el, eldest one, but um, that went, we went through that. So we would always, like, we've always been close. We've always, like, my INFP brother, Kevin, we've always been close. We've always got on well. We've always understood each other very well. Like, me and my brother, we have a symbiotic relationship. We are, I mean, we know what the other is feeling very easily, you know. Um, I don't know if I told you the story, but uh, once we we are both very, very HSP, and um, sometimes the very if someone is verbally were to describe like um, a particular scene, violent scene that happened, we'd be so sensitive that like it would not be uncommon for us to 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 faint at the same time. So very symbiotic, even though we're three and a half years apart, uh, age wise. Um, and interested in the same things, more or less, you know, art, literature, philosophy. Although from a certain point, my brothers really decided to go fully into, fully into literature. Like he's really expert at literature. Like it cannot be emphasized how much. And it, he has a master's in, in French literature. And for some of the some of the essays and some of the, some of the exams, he got like some absolutely stellar grades like it, it's the thing about my brother is that <laughs> and that's not because he's INFP I'm not associating INFP ness and laziness but my brother like sometimes he just work really hard and get an unbelievably stellar grades maybe the best of the whole university and for other things he'd be like a bit like oh you know I'm not I'm not as much into this oh grammar is not interesting or I don't like that as much and so he kind of you know he would he would just kind of you know, phone it in and he'd get a not so good grade. Um, so in the end, he always got really good grades, but they're not reflective of the extent of his talents. Like he's written some short stories that are really, really great. And I've always tried to emphasize that to him. Um, but let's say that towards maybe, yeah, like our late teens, you know, when I was 19, 20, 21, and he, he would have been a little bit younger, he was starting to embrace literature more and I was starting to embrace maybe, and that's really interesting in terms of the INFJ, INFP difference is that um, I think my TI was, was starting to develop at this point and it's almost like for some reason I was not satisfied with just like the literary approach. I wanted something that involved some ration, rationalizing but some, some reshoshinating like very concretely. So I looked towards history, social, like well, human science I looked towards philosophy, I looked towards these things. I also did literature, but our, the, 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 lecture, the teachers that had both him and myself always said that he was a little bit more creative and I was a little bit more structured. So it's an interesting uh, thing to point out. I mean, I consider myself to be creative, but I am creative, but he's more spontaneously creative. And that fits the kind of INFP versus the INFJ model. Uh, so, and these days, uh, as, as we get older, Kevin and I, we only get closer, basically. And I think that uh, he is one of my very best friends. And I, I dare hope that he is also one of my best friends, or it's rather that I am one of his best friends. And uh, I'm hoping that actually we'll go out tonight, which uh, should be fun. And I like to Marseille, the two brothers, the two Contini's together, Contini is my surname, um, drinking some whiskey and talking about uh, various pedantic and uh, pretentious topics. That should be fun. Uh, with Cedric, my ENFP brother, so I was always, I always got on very well with him. Um, but I have to say that it's a, a, a little bit as, a little bit like with Kevin, the FIFE difference was, 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 was notable and played a role 
in how we related to one another because I was always a little bit surprised by how I felt like my brother and Cedric also in his own way were holding back emotionally a little bit. They were not willing to express how they felt enough. And sometimes that confused me and made me feel self-conscious when I did express it myself. Uh, maybe the understanding the subtle distinctions between, you know, like extroverted in uh, feeling and introverted feeling would have been helpful then. Um, but I, I just, I wasn't paying enough attention to MBTI at the time. Uh, also, Marseille, Southern French Marseille society, you know, is it's pretty, it's pretty macho. Like uh, maybe there's this whole like cultural elements of men not really wanting to, to show emotion that much. Uh, so maybe that played a role. Cedric also, Cedric is one of the most amazingly curious people I know, like, and so that fits the ENFP thing. And my brother is also very curious, but it starts with a kind of judging filter, you know, like he wants to check whether that's worth his time or not. Whereas, and you can see, you know, dominance judging. With, with Cedric, it's like, yeah, tell me about this, come on, like, I want to, I want to know everything about it. And for two weeks, he'll be massively into it and, you know, Cedric is a great guy, like, and just like Kevin, but even more so, Cedric, and I mean, it has to be said, as talented as he is, he's not, he could be a little more industrious, you know. Uh, he's in New Caledonia now, like in an island in the, in the Pacific, and he's uh, working there um, for the, for the, like, what's it called, for, it's, it's, it's like, a, it's a civil servant job, you know. Um, he's working on, like, like trucks to, to clean the streets but of a very like he's a tech he's a technical dude at this point but like the, those trucks they're very very complex and complicated and there's not many people in France that can actually master them technically and know them well so he's very sought after but he he, he always expresses the regrets uh, that he didn't go on to study in university he went to university but he just kept stopping after a year and trying something else and in the end, he just didn't have anything, so he decided to do something a bit more manual, and that's fine. It, it suits him okay. But he's amazingly curious. You know, when I talked to him about MBTI, uh, he within within a few days he knew so much about it, and he was already mastering things that my brother, my mom, my dad are still asking me about sometimes. Oh yeah, so I know you explained to me like ten times what TI is, what FI is, and Cedric, I, I swear to you, like within less than twenty four hours, he, he had that sorted. He's incredible stuff. Uh, and I, I think he's a, honestly, both my brother and Cedric, they're, they're great guys. I'm glad they're my brothers. How do you personally deal with anxiety? Um, well, um, so that's the third question. How do I personally deal with anxiety? Um, well, I don't deal well with anxiety, unfortunately. So uh, I'm an anxious person. Uh, I feel like I'm a very HSP person, a very highly sensitive person. Um, and I'm quite an anxious, worry, worrying person. It's not easy for me to stop my brain from having a lot of thoughts that then cause some anxiety. So how do I deal with this? Um, well, I mean, maybe in a very practical way, the first way I deal with it is, uh, is uh, by, <clears throat> if it gets really bad, I actually, uh, I, I take medication. I take medication. The medication, I, I am familiar with the kind of medication that works for me and my anxiety. So I take it, um, it helps me usually, you know, I'm talking about antidepressants. Um, it, they're not very strong, but um, uh, they, I find them very helpful because they give me the kind of awareness to notice the triggers to my anxiety. So what, I try, what I've tried to do more since last year is when I had my pre-burnout thing at work, and what I, which I would consider with the highest peak in my anxiety in my whole life, it was really hard. And it was obviously anxiety slash depression. It was a bit of both. Um, I, I was just, as soon as it kind of like took over me, I, I was just completely overwhelmed by it. And I just, I, I just couldn't, I, I was overwhelmed. I just couldn't do anything. It was gone. It was like just anxious and I didn't know what to do. Like, should I take some, should I go to the doctor? You know, I, it was very hard. Occasionally I dealt with it unhealthily by, by drinking some alcohol. Never a lot, but you know, getting used to drink a little sip of whiskey like here and there. After a while, you know, it's it's not good if it starts developing into a habit. So eventually, I went to the doctor and and he prescribed me these, uh, the, these, like this medicine, which uh, has turned out to be quite useful in being having the hindsight. Like whenever I experience an anx an anxiety trigger for me, instead of just being overwhelmed by it straight away, I'm able to stand back from it, point it out identify it for what it is and try to not try to suppress it but try to say okay like this is the trigger and 
maybe I should arrange my day so that, you know, the trigger doesn't come into effect. So there are just some triggers. That, uh, and so at the moment, the way I'm trying to, try to deal with anxiety is to continue developing as much as possible of an, aware, an awareness of triggers. Now, I also try to go for walks a lot. I, I should do more sports, but uh, at least I go for like a half an hour to an hour walk every day. And I find that helps me too. Where do you recommend a beginner start when trying to learn about philosophy? Um, okay, I could talk about this forever. So I think maybe I'll make a video on that more specifically. Uh, so I'm not going to answer at length here, but what I would say is if, if you want to start uh, learning about philosophy, what I would say is that you try out the book, The History of Western Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. I think he wrote it in like 1942 or something. It came out at, at, at a weird date, like during the war or something. I think, could be wrong. He got the Nobel Prize for Literature because there's no Nobel Prize for Philosophy for that book and for the rest of his work. But um, what's great about the history of Western philosophy is that it's a, it's a book. So it goes from like the earliest times until it, it's, it, it finishes basically with the philosophy that was current around the time that Russell was writing that book. So it doesn't cover much of existentialism, doesn't cover much of uh, structuralism, post-structuralism, post-modernism, you know, the, the stuff that, <laughs> that Jordan Peterson uh, quite superficially describes and critiques. Um, so that's really interesting stuff. Um, but it, it's, it's still, I mean, it stops at the philosophy of logical analysis. So like the, the likes of his work and Wittgenstein, you know, Wittgenstein and stuff like that. It's still an amazing, uh, it's still an amazing sort of uh, breadth that's covered basically from 600 BC, he starts with Thales, you know, uh, the metaphysics of Thales, through Plato, Aristotle, and like all the important philosophers until logical analysis. And that's like a long period. And if you read that book, and if you pay attention, if you see that you enjoy it, because it has a lot of, the reason why I want to recommend that book is that it gives you a bird's eye view. It's not just like this introductory text that is devoid of charm and wit. You know, sometimes the thing about textbooks is that they, they're just a little bit too utilitarian for my taste, so I don't really experience the joy of reading them. It's almost like I'm just reading them for a purpose, and that's only the purpose, and that's maybe not enough. In this case, you read it for a purpose, to familiarize, to familiarize yourself with philosophy, but you're also going to enjoy Russell's wit, he's hilarious, and he gives you penetrating insight into the different philosophers. Instead of having just this, instead of having just this impersonal textbook that will just tell you, okay, so Heidegger did this, this, and that. And you know, it, you won't really necessarily remember it because even though it's presented clearly, it's devoid of passion and penetrating insights. Whereas Russell sometimes will say things that are controversial. He will say things that are not necessarily things that you want to agree with, but he gives you his own perspective. He is one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, and he's giving you in very simple terms, his opinion of other philosophers. It demystifies them. So, because all the time people are scared of studying certain philosophers because, um, because they're afraid they won't understand them because they're too smart or whatever. Russell, you see, like he makes fun of other philosophers. He points out their flaws. So it demystifies them, which is very useful. And he just speaks about them with penetrating insight. And so it doesn't even have to survey the whole of a, of a philosopher's philosophy. Just by talking about a couple points, the penetrating dimension of his insight will help you just gets the kernel of what the philosopher is about. So I really recommend History of Western Philosophy by Bert Russell. Try to buy it or maybe get a, a PDF of it. Uh, I think there's, there's, there are some available. So that's my advice, but I could make a whole video about that. Will you do any collabs, more interviews with your siblings, parents, friends, or other YouTubers? And that's the last question uh, by Jay. Uh, I would say that, yes, absolutely. I want to make some more collab, collab videos. I, I love them. So if my brother is up for making another one in the future, maybe not straight away, but in the future, about the topic that is interesting, I will definitely do that. I still have a plan to make a video with my mother, just her and me. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't know when it will come out, but it will come out at some point in the near future. And I'm hoping to convince my dad to do the same, just him and me. And then I have friends. I have friends that I would like to make videos with, uh, like real life friends. An INFP friend I can think about, and an ENFP friend I can think about. They've already accepted, like, uh, tentatively. So uh, I just need to be able to meet them in the right circumstances and we will do that. And I will continue to do collabs in the future for sure because I enjoy them. 
Right, Jay, that's for, that's for my long answers to your questions. I hope that they were uh, satisfactory. Now, Running Fox says, hi, Running Fox, uh, says, I'm curious as to your perspective on being a male INFJ. Also, you have mentioned you're an HSP as well. That would be interesting to hear about. Are you ever labeled a stuck up or something to that effect for being so quiet? Have people bullied you? Just some, th some thoughts. Okay, so uh, Running Fox, just to warn you, I'm not gonna give you more than like four or five minutes because the video is getting really long. I'm sorry about that, but I'll do my best, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> um, basically, when you say like, uh, have you ever been able to label that stuck up or something to that effect for being so quiet? Uh, so, I would say yes or no. I've been labeled as stuck up, but not for being quiet because I'm not actually that quiet. As you know, INFJs are often described as the least introverted of the introverts or the most intro extroverted of the introverts. So least likely to come across as particularly introverted. And I think that's true from those I've met in real life uh, because of the, our use of FE, right? So ISFJs and INFJs, uh, sometimes you, you'll notice when people try to type celebrities on, uh, online, Sometimes there'll be big debates between, oh, is that person an ISFJ or an ESFJ? Or is that person an INFJ or an ENFJ? But it will not happen nearly as often that someone will say, oh, is that person ISFP or ESFP? Because the difference between an ESFP and an ISFP is, is bigger than the, than the difference between an INFJ and an ENFJ often. Uh, anyway, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm actually quite chatty when I decide to come out. Um, the question is, when do I decide to come out? So, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm, com I'm, I'm probably going to go out tonight, but <laughs> it, there's nothing to... I mean, the reason why it's exciting is because I haven't act not actually been out and I haven't really seen anyone apart from my close family for, like, ever since I've been here. So it's been 22 days. So you see, I don't need to see people that much. I do need to see them. I need to remind myself of it because I don't want to NIT I loop. But I can do with that. And I don't, need, I don't like being always with people. But when I decide that I'm with people, I usually contribute quite a lot. So I, I'm, I've, I would never be described as quiet, I think, except by those who have only met me at parties that I felt completely sort of like uh, I, 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 out of touch with, out of source with, that, that I didn't fit in, you know? And uh, you know, that definitely has happened, but I don't really know the people there because I never saw them again. Uh, stuck up? Well, sometimes I'm just described as being a little like, all, you know, a bit too serious and, and, and like serious, too focused, too up in my head, uh, too like a bit nerdy, you know, these things. So that definitely has happened and it probably has to do with being an IN. Um, now, I've never been bullied because I have a strong personality and I've had it for a long time and I, I, I fight back. So, uh, and I defend others as well whenever I can. Uh, not to say that I'm the bravest man ever, like if the man is huge, it's not necessarily going to face up to him. But uh, yeah, like I usually stand up for myself, I think. So this probably has to do with why I've not been bullied. Um, now in general, um, male INFJ and HSP, well, I've talked about being HSP earlier in this video, so hopefully that satisfies you. Um, just it's something that I have to be aware of because it, it's, it's just uh, many other items added to the potential list of things that make me f more anxious. So noises, smells, conversations that I don't want to be hearing, but I have to hear stressful situations that I feel like to the 10th degree instead of feeling them normally, absorbing the emotions of others, that all happens and I just have to be careful to keep my boundaries, even though sometimes people are like, oh, boundaries, why do you put these boundaries? Why do you not do this and that? Got to protect myself. That's what it is. Being a male INFJ, um, you know, sometimes you're. I suppose you know. It's been. It's been. I've been. I've been told several times that I'm a bit effeminate. Like it's been told in reality by some people. And sometimes I've been uh, thought to be gay. Uh, I have some mannerisms, and in, I think that fits the cliche of certain male INFJs, at least how they're described. So that definitely happens to me, uh, but. Not that often, not that often, but it, it can happen. Um, and then I would say, yeah, you know, very sensitive and everything. Um, but with FE, you know, like uh, being a male INFJ means that you can also charm people. And that can be seen as a masculine thing. So in the end, I, I don't think that being a male INFJ is a curse. 
And I think I'll be making more videos specifically on the topic of male energy and how to make maybe the male energy feel more empowered and, uh, and, and things like that. And the energy more empowered, okay? All right, see you soon. Thanks for your question, guys. I'll talk to you soon.